Welcome to Not Too Reads, an audio library of revolutionary texts. Polemics on Protracted People's War. Proletarians of all countries unite. Who was first, and what is principle? Belisario writes, quote, Despite Canera's misplaced flattery, Mao was not the original proponent or first theorist of people's war as, quote, the military theory of the international proletariat, end quote, end quote. And he then moves on to mention Marx, Engels, and Lenin. Again, Belisario does not quote. Where has anyone claimed Mao to be the first theorist of revolutionary war? Again, this is pure opportunist and sinister claims. In the introduction to the line of construction of the three instruments of the revolution, the Communist Party of Peru writes, quote, Marx said that the working class creates organizations in its image and likeness, that is, its own organizations. In the 19th century, with Marx and Engels, we started off endowed with a scientific conception, our own doctrine, and our own objective, our common goal, how to take power and the means to do it, revolutionary violence. And, by the end of the 19th century, Engels came to the conclusion that the class did not have either the proper organic forms or the proper military forms to seize power and hold it. But he never said we should abandon the revolution. Rather, we should work for revolution, seeking a solution to these pending problems." End quote. All Maoists will acknowledge the contributions of other great communist leaders. Mao stood on the shoulders of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Stalin, as he underscored many a time, and as is underscored by Chairman Gonzalo. It is a rubbish claim by Belisario and speaks on his methods, as copied by the playbook of Sison. But who else than Mao systematized people's war? Would Belisario claim that Marx, Engels, or Lenin did this? It would be a really unique claim, one we haven't heard before. Then Belisario goes on, quote, Mao, of course, made immense contributions to proletarian military theory based on his vast leadership experience in the long years of Chinese revolution, as did Ho Chi Minh, Le Zuan, and Von Nguyen Zap in the case of the Vietnamese revolution, and Si Sun in the case of the Philippine revolution. All of them successfully applied proletarian military theory to practical questions of people's war in their respective countries and in the process enriched such theory." End quote. We encounter here the arch-typical right opportunist reasoning. Mao was not first because Ho Chi Minh, Le Zuan, Zap, and Sison. What is typical here? The unwillingness or inability to tell what is principle. Is Sison of the same importance to the proletarian military theory as Chairman Mao? We do not think Belisario would claim this. What about Ho, Le Zuan, or Zap? And his eagerness to strip Mao of misplaced flattery, he reduces Mao's contributions in military questions to one of many. The bourgeois Thomas Marx is wrong. Mao was not to irregular warfare what Clausewitz and Napoleon were to regular warfare. He was simply one of many, is how Belisario sees it. We know this reasoning from how stale dogmatists and opportunists the same refuse Maoism. Mao was simply a Marxist-Leninist, a great revolutionary of China, or even, as Hojas claim, just a bourgeois nationalist. Further on, who was first? The concrete application of people's war in Vietnam and the Philippines happened mainly after Mao's application in China. They were clearly inspired and guided by the contributions of Mao. If one reads General Zop on people's war, this is very clear. He copies the three stages of the People's War, and he adheres to the same principles as Mao had already outlined, like, quote, concentration of troops to realize an overwhelming superiority over the enemy, end quote, like, quote, initiative, suppleness, rapidity, surprise, suddenness in attack and retreat, end quote, like, quote, exhaust little by little by small victories the enemy forces, and at the same time, 
to maintain and increase ours, end quote. And, quote, losses must be avoided even at the cost of losing ground, end quote. This is Von Yuen's up, but firstly, these principles were formulated by Chairman Mao. Does Belisario suggest Zapp did not know the writings of Chairman Mao? We doubt it. The Value of Synthesis for Concrete Application Belisario writes, quote, However, these communist leaders did not set out to synthesize a universally applicable theory on how to wage armed revolution or forge some military theory of the international proletariat, as Quinera claims Gonzalo had done. In fact, these great leaders repeatedly emphasized, quote, concrete analysis of concrete conditions, end quote, and carefully applied theory to grapple with the specific characteristics of their own countries and solve concrete problems of their own revolutions, end quote. When we spoke of letting all the cats out of the bag, this is a couple of them. In his reasoning, there is no military theory of the proletariat, nothing universal at all, only specific characteristics and concrete problems. It is staggering. These revolutionary leaders set out to apply the universal of theory on the specific revolutions they partook in. It is not important if they set out to synthesize. The principal aspect is to apply, but in application on the particular, the universal shows itself at least if applied correctly and with success. All the before-mentioned leaders would, at least in words, adhere to the universal laws of armed revolution and of Marxism-Leninism in general. They would not pretend they did not. And what makes revolutionary war something different from the rest of the body of Marxism-Leninism-Maoism? Mao stated that the highest form of class struggle is revolutionary war. Why should this not have universal laws and principles? How could we agree, if we do, on universal Leninist principles of party organization, but deny even the existence of a universal proletariat military theory? In the last paragraph of the Mao article quoted by Belisario, Problems of War and Strategy, Mao writes, quote, But so far, only a few people have taken up the study of the problems of strategy and the theory of war. First-rate results have been achieved in the study of our political work which, in wealth of experience and in the number and quality of its innovations, ranks second only to that of the Soviet Union. Here, too, the shortcoming is insufficient synthesis and systematization, end quote. Does this sound like a leader that did not set out to synthesize? In the first paragraph of the same text, Mao writes, quote, The seizure of power by armed force, the settlement of the issue by war, is the central task in the highest form of revolution. This Marxist-Leninist principle of revolution holds good universally for China and for all other countries, end quote. Does this sound like a leader who does not have great regard for what is universal? Mao writes in 1938 that there were shortcomings in the systematization and synthesizing of the period up to 1938. And still, there would be 11 years of people's war in China, followed by 27 years of socialist construction and cultural revolution before Mao died. Even the period before 1938 was not yet properly systematized and synthesized in the view of Mao. How could this article be the final say in the question we are discussing? It is not important if Mao set out to systematize the military theory of the proletariat. What is important is that he did this, in theory and in application. And to deny it, like Belisario does, is simply to refuse to learn the lesson of hard-fought victories and defeats, insisting on making the same errors over and over again. In its essence, to learn is often to synthesize. Even basic lessons like stoves are hot, don't touch stoves, comprise of some synthesizing. The likes of Belisario might rage over such focus on universality, insisting that every stove is unique and must be understood in its concrete and particular situation. But most parents would understand the value of systematization and synthesis when you set out to guide concrete application. On the Militarization of the Communist Parties
Belisario goes on and asks, quote, What exactly is meant by a militarized communist party? Does it mean that the principle of democratic centralism, which applies to the essentially civilian and voluntary membership of the CP, will be replaced by a military command structure and its concomitant military law and military discipline? End quote. If we set out to debate this topic, we would at least read the Communist Party of Peru's most relevant documents, such as the general political line and the five lines it is made up of. There, in the line of construction, they write, quote, In the first national conference, November 1979, Chairman Gonzalo expounded the thesis of the necessity of militarizing the Communist Party of Peru. Afterward, in the first months of 1980, when the party was preparing to launch the People's War, he proposed to develop the militarization of the party through actions, basing himself on what the great Lenin said about reducing the non-military work in order to center it on the military. That the times of peace were ending, and we were entering into the times of war, so that all forces should be militarized. Thus taking the party as the axis of everything, build the army around it, and with these instruments, with the masses and the people's war, build the new state around both. That the militarization of the party can only be carried forward through concrete actions of the class struggle, concrete military-type actions. This does not mean we will only carry out various types of military actions exclusively, guerrilla actions, sabotages, selective annihilation, armed propaganda, and agitation, but that we must carry out mainly these forms so as to provide incentive and development to the class struggle, teaching with deeds, with these types of actions as the principal form of struggle in the people's war." End quote. In the same line document, they write, quote, In its organic structure, the party is based on democratic centralism, principally centralism. Two armed party networks are established, the territorial network, which encompasses one jurisdiction, and the mobile network, whose structure is deployed. The organic system is the distribution of forces in function of the principal and secondary points wherever the revolution is acting. Party work is the relationship between secret work, which is principal, and open work. The importance of the five necessities, democratic centralism, clandestinity, discipline, vigilance, and secrecy, particularly democratic centralism, end quote. To answer, then, Belisario's question, another sinister one, we might add, militarization does not replace democratic centralism. It is not the first time such questions have been raised against the concept of militarization of the communist parties. We write our answer here not for Belisario, who probably will continue asking the same questions for the cause of trying to sow confusion, but for the honest reader. In the article, Lenin and the Militarized Communist Party, in the magazine El Mawita, they write, quote, As we stated in the introduction, the Militarized Communist Party has its foundations in Lenin and Chairman Mao, but it was developed by Chairman Gonzalo and the PCP. Chairman Gonzalo, creatively applying Marxism-Leninism-Maoism to the concrete practice of the Peruvian Revolution, developed, through the glorious and invincible People's War, the theory and practice of the Communist Party, raising it to a new level, that of the militarized Marxist-Leninist-Maoist Communist Party and the line of concentric construction of the three instruments of the revolution." End quote. If Belisario wants to write polemics against militarization of the Communist Parties, he should start with this article of the Latin American Comrades. It gives a thorough presentation of the question, and on a much more advanced level than we can hope to do any time soon. The Communist Party of Peru applied the concept of the militarized Communist Party in concentric construction as particularities in the People's War of Peru, but came to the conclusion that this is a contribution of universal validity. To sum it up, in our best but limited manner, it is to make the Communist Party a party of and for the People's War, and secure its dedication to the People's War and its undivided leadership of the People's War through the People's Army and the Front New State. The Communist Party of Peru has, in its general political line, presented the six characteristics of the construction of the militarized party. Ideological construction, one. Political construction, two. Organizational construction, three. The leadership, four. Two-line struggle, five. And mass work, six.
why the strategy of protracted accumulation is wrong. Belisario writes, quote, Kinera rejects the so-called strategy of protracted legal accumulation to the brink of crisis and revolution in capitalist countries as an old strategy, and chides Sison of being never tired of the protracted legal accumulation of forces in weight and want of the cataclysm of crisis. But he doesn't produce any arguments that show why such strategy is incorrect, end quote. We do not agree. Many arguments have been produced to show this strategy is incorrect. But we are happy to repeat some and add some. We must emphasize that these are our own arguments. We do not speak for anyone else, and our errors and shortcomings are our own. 1. This accumulist legalist strategy has not produced any revolutions for at least 80 years, and have not even come close to toppling a bourgeois state in this period. 2. People's War Strategy has produced revolutions and has become a major threat to many reactionary states in several continents. 3. The strategy of protracted legal accumulation is in practice identical to the practice of reformist right opportunists. It does not prepare revolutionary leaders, cadre, activists, or masses for grasping political power with revolutionary violence. 4. This strategy paves the way for capitalist work methods of NGOism, bureaucratic work methods of the social democratic labor movement, and reformist work methods of ministerial socialism. 5. The strategy and tactics of people's war apply to revolutionary warfare in imperialist countries, as we, partly, not entirely, might observe in the War of Liberation in Ireland and the Basque Country. 6. In the shining illuminating light of people's war, as explained by Mao Zedong, we should be able to understand better the experiences of anti-fascist resistance during World War II in Europe. In countries like France and Norway, for example, there was protracted armed warfare during Nazi occupation and collaboration. It indicates that revolutionary war is possible in industrialized countries with high degrees of control and surveillance. 7. The experiences of armed groups like the KAK, RAF, and the Red Brigades prove the possibility of waging armed struggle inside the imperialist countries, even for decades, without being militarily defeated. 8. The experiences of protracted legal work, of accumulation of forces, have led to no revolution. They have led countless parties and organizations into revisionism, reformism, or simply dissolvement. Their cadre and sympathizers have been integrated more and more into the old society and even the reactionary state apparatus. 9. We march towards militarized societies. The imperialist countries militarize more and more. The reaction is more militarized. 10. The governments of imperialism develop towards fascism, through corporativism, undermining parliamentarism, growing racism, more police surveillance, and state violence. 11. The elections are seen as farcical by the majority of the deepest and broadest masses. Most of them do not have any faith in them. 12. The old social democratic trade unions have lost significant masses of members. The masses do not trust the trade union leadership. 13. We have entered the epoch of proletarian world revolution and people's war sweeping away imperialism in the next 50 to 100 years, as stated by Mao. 14. The big and complex develops from the small and simple, and one learns war from waging war. Thus, revolutionary war must be grown from the little to the grand, and revolutionary fighters must learn war by waging war in a protracted process. 15. As Clausewitz stated in On War, quote, The greater and more powerful the motives of a war, by so much the nearer will the war approach to its abstract form, so much the more will it be directed to the destruction of the enemy, so much nearer will the military and political ends coincide, so much the more purely military and less political the war appears to be, end quote. 
and what is a more great and powerful motive of war than seizing power for the proletariat? This makes more war, more protracted war, and not quicker and more limited war. On the Particular Experiences of War and Fascism in Europe Belisario quotes Sison and elaborates, quote, Sison explains, quote, Even if the material foundation for socialism exists in capitalism, the proletariat must first defeat fascism, thus winning the battle for democracy before socialism can triumph, end quote. He was actually anticipating the convulsions of capitalist crises and the rise of fascism, which impels all proletarian revolutionaries to prepare for future armed conflict even prior to the actual socialist revolution. This was, in fact, the scenario that led to communist-led forces waging extensive partisan warfare in Europe during World War II and even earlier during the Spanish Civil War, end quote. This comparison completely disregards what were the mistakes and successes of the communist movement in this period. Can the success of partisan warfare in Europe be attributed to the line of Sison that Belisario promotes, a protracted legal struggle? The experience of Norway and many other European countries is that the communist parties had disregarded the tasks originally given to them by the communist international. In its 21 conditions for membership, the common turn demanded in the third condition, quote, Under such conditions, the communists can place no trust in bourgeois legality. They have the obligation of setting up a parallel organization apparatus which, at the decisive moment, can assist the party to do its duty to the revolution. In every country where a state of siege or emergency laws deprive the communists of the opportunity of carrying on all their work legally, it is absolutely necessary to combine legal and illegal activity, end quote. This task was totally neglected by many parties. Instead, the widespread legalist practice made the Norwegian and other European communist parties wide open for being smashed by the fascists once they grabbed state power in some countries, followed by the occupation of many more. The result was tens of thousands of communists killed, jailed, and put in concentration camps. And it seriously hampered the communist resistance. The protracted legalism of the Communist Party of Norway was fatal. Belisario and Sison parade the communist resistance in Spanish Civil War. If Sison and Belisario see the situation returning with the rise of fascism, why are they attacking those who want to build communist parties capable of waging wars? If they see guerrilla warfare as a tool against fascism, why do they monger fear of the huge army overwhelming the people's army? In fact, their failure to see any lessons is clear. They are not capable of learning that protracted legal struggle led to the arrest and deaths of communists in Europe during the rise of fascism. That the huge army could not smash armed struggle, even in countries where the resistance was relatively weak that this was even possible when the front line and allied forces were 1,000 kilometers and several years away. With this inability to put the experiences of armed struggle in imperialist countries to use, why do they then claim that it is we who do not concern ourselves with developing strategies based on the particularities of our own countries? Opposing the military theory of the proletariat under the pretext of flexibility. Belisario writes, quote, These are all opportunities for the proletariat to arm itself and seize power when the conditions are ripe, and make the necessary but calibrated or discreet preparations prior. But Kinera doesn't see the underlying Marxist-Leninist logic. He is singular obsessed with the template of PPW, as synthesized by Gonzalo, needing to be implemented now. Anything outside the template is branded as revisionism, reformism, or legalism, end quote. Here, Belisario's argument is that the proponents of protracted people's war are proponents of people's war. We are guilty of this claim. We do adhere to the universality of people's war. It is true that we propose this strategy must be implemented now. That is, 
If it is not waged, it needs to be initiated. If it is not initiated, it needs to be prepared. If it is not prepared, it needs to be defined. In all our work, all the work of the communists, must be for the people's war. We do claim this, but we do not claim it dogmatically. We argue the facts. We consider the experience. We propose the synthesis of universal laws based on particularities, experience, analysis, and lessons of 200 years of proletarian class struggle. This is not an obsession, but a recognition of necessity. It is true. We thus discard the accumulationist strategy of protracted legal struggle and preparations for the cataclysmic crisis where objective conditions gives, quote, all opportunities for the proletariat to arm itself and seize power, end quote. We discard this to be a fairy tale fitting hand in glove with revisionism. This was the position of the communist parties of Europe, who were mostly smashed in 1940, rebuilt during the war as warfare parties, but then disarmed themselves in 1945 and again turned back to legalism. It has been the position of most of the Marxist-Leninist movement of the 1970s, who either have dissolved or degenerated into reformist electoralist parties. These parties have not made the discrete preparations to seizing power by violence. Not at all, in fact. We know them, and we know them quite well. Belisario's claim of Marxist-Leninist logic is nothing else than what the communists of China exposed in the great polemic of the 1960s, in The Differences Between Comrade Togliatti and Us. Quote, The modern revisionists are opposing Marxism-Leninism under the pretext of flexibility and tactics, end quote. Many activists buy into this. They believe this is what they are doing. They believe they are being flexible and exploiting legality by protracted legalism. It is our job not to be arrogant or treat these people with hostility, but to be patient and argue our case. Of course, no one will agree with us just because we say they should, or because Gonzalo said so. Serious people will demand serious answers, facts, and summations. This is what the Communist Party of Peru has given. They have applied the theory of people's war, as synthesized principally by Mao Zedong, on the people's war in Peru, and thus proved its universality. As it is also being proved in Turkey, India, and the Philippines. It is being explained and applied by great Maoists as the Communist Party of Brazil Red Faction. Sison and the Promotion of Right Opportunism and Liquidationism Belisario writes, quote, Despite their mantra of PPW, they have not done anything to start any kind of people's war in Norway or assist such war, if any, in some other industrial capitalist country or give any significant kind of help to the people's wars going on somewhere else in the world. They still need to grow from their small group status and infantile mentality by doing serious mass work among the Norwegian workers and engaging in truly MLM party building to be able to contribute more significantly to the resurgence of the world proletarian revolution against imperialism, revisionism, and all reaction, end quote. This is a coward's way of arguing. When Belisario is tired of arguing the principles, he wants to argue the person. From the point of Sison, it would be more understandable. Everyone knows where Sison is coming from. But who is Andy Belisario? The first articles of Kinera were not statements of organizations, but were promoted by Chen Folk at Media, and we don't deny Kinera is a supporter of the Maoist movement of Norway. But where is PRISM based? The webpage does not tell. What organization or movement does Belisario support? He does not tell. One might think his angry words against the Maoists of Norway signal he is in some way connected to a big and successful communist party. Who knows? As far as we can tell, he does not even say he adheres to Maoism. The NDFP webpage and the ILPS chairperson, Sison, promote Belisario. Our own article does not set out to investigate or write about the People's War in the Philippines. 
It is one of the four people's wars today, and we support it wholeheartedly. On the workings of CISON, ILPS, and DFP abroad, especially in the imperialist countries, we will address three points. 1. Twelve members of the leadership of ILPS disclosed undemocratic and hegemonic aspirations in the ILPS, led by its leader, José María Sison, in 2011, resulting in their expulsion from ILPS and furious attacks from Sison. Most known of the twelve is probably Professor Sebaba of India. To underscore this fact, the well-known Professor Sebaba was expelled by Sison and the ILPS. Other expelled comrades represented mass organizations in the USA, Turkey, Brazil, Greece, and Iran. 2. The right opportunist line of Peru is represented in the ILPS by a Movadef group. Movadef are traitors of the People's War of Peru, but they are included and defended in the ILPS. 3. Sison does not promote the need for organizing communists or unifying under Maoism, but promotes right opportunist and revisionist parties and organizations in Europe and the Americas. The right liquidationist Jugendwiderstand and the reformist MLPD of Germany are among those who are supported and promoted by Sison. In summation, the practice of Belisario's promoters in Europe and the Americas does not differentiate between truly MLM party building and the necessary but calibrated or discreet preparations by Marxist-Leninists on the one hand and legalist, reformist, right opportunist, right liquidationist, and traitorous parties and cliques on the other hand. Or they do differentiate by attacking those who do build Maoist parties and do necessary definition and preparation and warmly embracing and saluting all forms of right opportunism. Even the mere CISON slash NDFP promotion of Belisario's frontal attack on Chairman Gonzalo and the theory of people's war as universally applicable is a prime example of what line is being promoted by the center based in the Netherlands. We know this attitude of being soft on revisionism and aggressively attacking left communism very well. It is a typical feature of right to opportunism itself. Again, we mean no disrespect against the Communist Party of the Philippines and the cadre and masses they organize and lead in the People's War of the Philippines. We do not set out to criticize the revolution in the Philippines. Not that this would be principally wrong, but it is not in the scope of our capacity. Also, we emphasize our heartfelt respect for the combatants and the blood that has been shed for the new democratic revolution and proletarian world revolution. We owe a great debt to the People's War, its combatants and martyrs. It does not, however, exempt Sison or anyone promoted by him or the NDFP webpage from criticism. On the contrary, it makes it even more important since they might promote right opportunism under disguise of supporting the People's War or hold the People's War up as some shield against the two-line struggle. Gonzalo did not create Maoism, but was the first to define it. Belisario writes, quote, Quinera idolizes Gonzalo to high heavens for his role in synthesizing Maoism. These incredibly arrogant claims by Quinera, following his idol Gonzalo, is a brazen insult to Mao, who after his death apparently needed another thinker to synthesize for the very first time his well-known teachings, and to pin on it the shiny new name Maoism. It is a historic slap at the Chinese Communist Party, which up to 1976 was led by Mao himself, together with other proletarian revolutionaries, and which was guided by Mao's theories which was called Mao Zedong thought and eventually Maoism." End quote. Belisario's text is dripping with venom. On behalf of Sison, and now Mao and the Communist Party of the Philippines, he lashes out against those who he claims insults them. Like there is any insult against Mao in synthesizing Maoism as the third and higher stage of Marxism-Leninism, that is, Marxism-Leninism-Maoism, principally Maoism. Listen to the insults against Mao from the Communist Party of Peru. Quote, 
three big historical landmarks must be emphasized in the present century. First, the October Revolution of 1917, which opened the era of the World Proletarian Revolution. Second, the triumph of the Chinese Revolution in 1949, which changed the correlation of forces in favor of socialism. And third, the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution, which began in 1966 as the continuation of the revolution under the proletarian dictatorship in order to maintain the revolutionary course towards communism. It is enough to emphasize that Chairman Mao led two of these glorious historical feats, end quote. And, quote, The key point is to see how, in this great class struggle on the world level, Gonzalo Thought considers that a third stage of the proletarian ideology arises, first as Marxism-Leninism, comma, Mao Zedong Thought, then Marxism-Leninism, Mao Zedong Thought, and later it is defined as Maoism, understanding its universal validity, and in this way, reaching Marxism-Leninism-Maoism, principally Maoism, as the present expression of Marxism, end quote. We hold this not to be insults, but facts. Neither Mao nor the Communist Party of China synthesized what is Maoism and understood this as a third and higher stage of proletarian ideology. It is fact. Belisario blurs this by stating the CPC, quote, was guided by Mao's theories, which was called Mao Zedong thought, and eventually Maoism, end quote. It is correct it was guided by Mao Zedong thought. This was understood and formulated by Mao and the CPC as the concrete application of Marxism-Leninism on the particular revolution of China. But it was not understood as a third and higher stage of proletarian revolution universally applicable. This is explained masterly in the article concerning Lenin's thought in El Maoista, also referred to earlier in this document. We might have made some errors in our formulations. We might have been unclear. The synthesis of Maoism is not about inventing, but of revealing. To define Maoism is not to invent it, but to apply and thereby understand what is universal. And the application of Mao's thought led to really understanding what is universal, and understanding how he developed the proletarian ideology in all three realms, in philosophy, economy, and socialism. Chairman Gonzalo did not invent Maoism, neither did he develop Maoism. Maoism was mainly forged in the People's War in China, in the New Democratic Revolution, the Socialist Construction, and the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution under the leadership of Mao. But Maoism, as a third and higher stage of the ideology of the proletariat, was firstly understood and explained by Chairman Gonzalo. It was firstly defined by him. The struggle against the so-called cult of personality is an attack on democratic centralism. Further on, as the followers of Lenin and Mao, also the followers of Gonzalo get our fair share of such frenetic slander as Belisario throws at us. When we uphold Gonzalo, when we define him as the greatest living Maoist, we idolize to high heavens. He talks of their dear Gonzalo, his idol Gonzalo, his Gonzaloite friends, etc., so much hot air, so little substance. We do not idolize anyone, but as Mao is the greatest living communist from 1953 to 1976, Gonzalo is today. Belisario does not agree. Let him disagree and explain why, but this slander and hot air are mere distractions. Gonzalo is no demigod. He is the great leader of the People's War of Peru and has made substantial contributions to Marxism-Leninism-Maoism by applying it on the concrete revolution of Peru. That is Gonzalo thought. This is our position. Let us explain why. But Belisario's sneering attitude speaks to his contempt of both theory and practice, that is, the People's War of Peru. We find this interesting, because it reminds us how right opportunists have always attacked the leadership. Listen to the Khrushchev renegades attack Mao and the CPC in an editorial of Pravda named The Anti-Soviet Policy of Mao Zedong and His Group. Quote, The entire practice of the CPSU and the other communist parties, which are consistently developing Leninist standards in inner-party life, 
strengthening the principles of collective leadership, and strictly adhering to democratic principles in the activities of all party organizations from top to bottom, naturally creates a danger to Mao Zedong and his power, for Mao Zedong's group has long been attacking its own party. The most elementary standards and principles of inner party life, the elective nature of party bodies, the responsibility of leaders to the party and party organizations, publicity and the discussion of the party line, etc., have been trampled underfoot in China. The cult of the personality of Mao Zedong has reached absurd lengths and has become actual idolatry." End quote. From Khrushchev's attack on the so-called cult of personality of Stalin, to their identical attack on the leadership of Mao, to Belisario's attack on the idolatry of Gonzalo, there is a coherent dark and reactionary thread. On the one hand, they might blur the leadership, but generally are happy to promote their own leaders in the most blatant and servile way. The Communist Party of Peru states, quote, Reaction has two principles to destroy the revolution. Annihilate its leadership and isolate the guerrilla from the masses. But in synthesis, its problem is to annihilate the leadership, because that is what enables us to maintain our course and realize it, end quote. In the great debate between the CPC and the CPSU, the editorial departments of the Chinese People's Daily and Red Flag writes on the question of Stalin, quote, The Central Committee of the CPC pointed out in its letter of June 14 that the struggle against the personality cult violates Lenin's integral teachings on the interrelationship of leaders, party, class, and masses, and undermines the communist principle of democratic centralism, unquote. There is no coincidence in the right opportunist attacks on Gonzalo and so-called idolization and cult of personality, with the same words as Khrushchevites once used against the great Stalin and the great chairman. We do not here compare Gonzalo to the before-mentioned great leaders, but acknowledge his role in understanding and promoting Maoism as a third and higher stage, and applying Maoism on the People's War in Peru, and in this forging Gonzalo thought which also has contributions of universal applicability. On the so-called cult of personality, Gonzalo answers like this in the interview with Chairman Gonzalo, made by El Diario. Quote, Here we must remember how Lenin saw the relationship between the masses, classes, the party, and leaders. We believe that the revolution, the party, our class, generate leaders, a group of leaders. It has been like this in every revolution. If we think, for instance, about the October Revolution, we have Lenin, Stalin, Sverdlov, and a few others, a small group. Similarly, in the Chinese Revolution, there's also a small group of leaders. Chairman Mao Zedong and his comrades Kang Sheng, Chang Qing, Zhang Chunqiao, among others. All revolutions are that way, including our own. We could not be an exception. Here, it's not true that there is an exception to every rule because what we're talking about here is the operation of certain laws. All such processes have leaders, but they also have a leader who stands out above the rest or who leads the rest, in accordance with the conditions. Not all leaders can be viewed in exactly the same way. Marx is Marx, Lenin is Lenin, Chairman Mao is Chairman Mao. Each is unique and no one is going to be just like them." End quote. the only party in the world in the vanguard of the defense of Maoism. Belisario writes, quote, Quinera's claim that the PCP was the only Maoist party in the world in 1982 is a blatant lie, if only because the Communist Party of the Philippines had already been reestablished earlier in 1968 on the basis of its founding cadre's firm grasp of Maoist theory and its application to concrete Philippine conditions. In Rectify Errors and Rebuild the Party, a major CPP document of re-establishment issued in 1968, Mao Zedong thought was already repeatedly and correctly described as the acme of Marxism-Leninism in the current world era. The CPP has been assiduously building itself and achieving victories in People's War on the basis of MLM since then, as its voluminous documents, publications, and study courses show. 
before claiming we are liars, an honest revolutionary, then excluding Belisario, would seek to clearly define then what is a Maoist party. It is quite clear to us that we depart from Belisario here. Of course, the Communist Party of the Philippines adhered to Mao Zedong thought. But, as we have stated, adhering to the understanding put forth by the Communist Party of Peru, Mao Zedong thought and Maoism are not the same. As the party writes, quote, Nevertheless, while Marxism-Leninism has obtained an acknowledgement of its universal validity, Maoism is not completely acknowledged as the third stage. Some simply deny its condition as such, while others only accept it as Mao Zedong thought. In essence, both positions, with the obvious differences between them, deny the general development of Marxism made by Chairman Mao Zedong. The denial of this ism character of Maoism denies its universal validity, and, consequently, its condition is the third, new, and superior stage of the ideology of the international proletariat, Marxism-Leninism-Maoism, principally Maoism, that we uphold, defend, and apply." End quote. In the international line of the party, they write, quote, In 1980, the PCP launched the People's War based on Marxism-Leninism-Mao Zedong thought. It is in the applying and developing the People's War that the PCP has advanced further in the comprehension of Maoism as the third stage of Marxism. Hence, at the second national conference held in May 1982, the party agreed that Marxism-Leninism-Maoism was the third stage of Marxism. Thus, the PCP was the only party in the world in the vanguard of the defense of Maoism, and assumed the task of struggling for the unity of the Marxist-Leninist-Maoists of the world so that this ideology be the command and guide of the Peruvian and world revolutions." End quote. And this line also elaborates on the historical development of Maoism. Let us not make this a discussion about what was a real Maoist party in 1982. Let us just say we agree with the Communist Party of Peru, and state as a matter of fact that, quote, the PCP was the only party in the world in the vanguard of the defense of Maoism, end quote. We acknowledge that the Communist Party of Peru by no means was alone in adhering to Mao Zedong thought. When the Communist Party of the Philippines was reconstituted in 1968, they stated in the preamble, quote, the integration of the universal theory of Marxism-Leninism-Mao Zedong thought with the concrete practice of the Philippine Revolution is the highest task of the Communist Party of the Philippines. The Communist Party of the Philippines is a revolutionary party of the proletariat that draws lessons from all previous revolutionary struggles of the Filipino people and from the great teachings of Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, and Mao Zedong. It is in stride with the advance of the theory and practice of the world proletarian revolution guided by Marxism-Leninism-Mao Zedong thought." Quote. In 1968, this was a correct and bold statement. But Maoism was yet to be synthesized as the third and higher stage of proletarian ideology. Even though the Communist Party of Peru state in their international line that they, and others, were just waiting for the Communist Party of China to make this synthesis and claim themselves. In 1991, a couple of decades later, the chairman of the Communist Party of the Philippines does not mention Mao Zedong thought in the article Reaffirm Our Basic Principles and Carry the Revolution Forward. He only mentions Marxism-Leninism, and writes, quote, the advanced level provides the party members with a comprehensive and profound knowledge of materialist philosophy, historical materialism, political economy, scientific socialism, and the world revolution as taught by such great communist thinkers and leaders as Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, Mao, and Ho. This provides us with the most extensive and deep-going understanding of the basic principles of the proletarian revolution and proletarian dictatorship." End quote. In the latest program of the Communist Party of the Philippines, they uphold Marxism-Leninism-Maoism as universal, but also write that they, quote, learn basic principles from the teachings of Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, Mao, Ho, and other great communist leaders, end quote. This seemingly eclectic approach to theory is concerning. Also, 
we do not know what is the universally applicable contributions of Ho Chi Minh, or why he is elevated to the level of Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, and Mao. This is not a known or acknowledged position of Ho Chi Minh in the international communist movement. When we refer to Gonzalo, we can answer why we do so, even though we are not experts in Gonzalo thought by any means. But we at least have a rudimentary understanding of what is Gonzalo thought and what is specific to this theory. What does Belisario mention Ho in Von Yuen Zap when he speaks of the military theory of people's war? What did they contribute to this theory? The war of national liberation in Vietnam was of immense importance. But how did this elevate the theoretical body of people's war? In Zop's words, Vietnam differed from China in being a small country and a direct colony, but we have not investigated this thoroughly. If Belisario or others could tell us what lessons of Vietnam are different or new compared to China, and then have been applied in the Philippines, we might stand corrected. Further, Belisario is again offended on behalf of others, this time the Communist Party of the Philippines, when he writes that, quote, Mao Zedong thought was already repeatedly and correctly described as the acme of Marxism-Leninism in the current world era, end quote, and that the, quote, CPP has been assiduously building itself and achieving victories in people's war on the basis of MLM since then, end quote. But we hold that there is a qualitative difference from applying Mao Zedong thought and to fight to bring Maoism into the command of the world proletarian revolution. This is not a competition. It's not about who gets a medal. But we cannot understand our ideology if we are not precise and clear. <laughs>